Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this week's View on Africa briefing. My name is Omar Mahmoud, and I'm a researcher in the Addis Ababa office at the Institute for Security Studies. And the topic this week, we're going to be looking at Boko Haram after Sambisa. Now, uh, what we mean by this is essentially um, Muhammad President, Nigerian President Muhammad Buhari, made a pretty big announcement towards the end of 2016 regarding the status of Boko Haram. Now, he has a bit of a habit of doing this. At the end of 2015, he uh, infamously stated the group was technically defeated, which was a little unclear what he meant by that. And given the, the rate of violence that we've seen in, in the continued year, a bit misleading, I think what he was talking about was how Boko Haram had been pushed from a lot of areas of territorial control, which was accurate, but I think his words were a bit uh, perhaps optimistic and misleading. Anyways, at the end of 2016, uh, just uh, two months ago, six weeks ago, he stated that Sambisa Forest had been retaken and cleared from Boko Haram militants. Now, this is a big deal because Sambisa Forest has uh, become a bit of a symbolic uh, uh, issue in, in the fight against Boko Haram, but also one of their main safe havens in one of the areas where they were hiding out. And it's a rather large stretch of area in, in southern central Borno state area. So uh, Buhari's announcement that Sambisa Forest had been taken, that the militants are on the run, that this was their last enclave, is a, a definite significant um, advancement in, in the war against Boko Haram. And it really was the culmination of a few different operations specifically targeting that area over the past few months. So a big symbol, very big symbolic victory for sure. But in some ways, I think it also symbolizes some of the failures of the Nigerian army in the war against Boko Haram and some of these persistent failures. For example, despite this, this major offensive to take back uh, Sambisa, there was absolutely no sign whatsoever of Boko Haram leader Abu Bakr Shako. We've been told for a long time he's hiding, uh, likely in, in the Sambisa forest or in these areas. Uh, and I, I think uh, the fact that there wasn't even a whiff of him that we, that we know of kind of shows that Boko Haram at least was, was a little prepared for this sort of assault, had, had made some contingency plans if he was there or if other key leaders were there. Uh, and really the, the most important point, the fact that they were able to still move around in the area undetected and to, to other areas and other safe havens. Um, so that, that's one aspect. The, the other issue is, uh, again, looking at high value sort of um, uh, uh, people in, in, in this battle, the, the Chibok schoolgirls. They, uh, about 195 of them are still missing and none of them really turned up during this battle either. There was one one girl who later um, became identified as a Chibok girl uh, amongst a group of uh, uh, detainees from this area, but that leaves 195 other girls missing. So the fact that uh, we didn't really get a whiff or sight of any of them, I think, is, is another issue in securing these high value uh, uh, people in this battle. Um, and again, really shows the, the ability of Boko Haram to have other areas which they're hiding in and the movement of, of the group. At the same time, the, the impact of this sort of announcement is a bit debatable, especially when we're talking about in terms of reduction of violence. Suicide attacks since Buhari's uh, late December announcement haven't really gone down. We've recorded 18 different incidents in, in the past uh, one and a half months. And I think there's a, a good story a suicide bomber who was um, detained yesterday that kind of illustrates how uh, the, the fall of Sambisa might not really affect these operations. And so uh, th this was an 18-year-old girl who was deployed by Boko Haram on a suicide mission but did not wind up detonating and was detained by security forces. And, and her story uh, came out uh, yesterday and this morning. And, and so basically what she was saying is she had traveled three days to get to my degree that she confirmed she was part of the Shikho faction and but importantly that she was told when she gets to my degree detonate anywhere there's a crowd so i think this tells us a few things one that the bombers are being um held and being uh, equipped 
a significant distance from my degree if she had to travel three days to get there, uh, which is important actually that they're not being being uh, trained and equipped within the city itself, but these these actions are still taking place in other sorts of safe havens and other sorts of areas where Boko Haram is hiding out. So that's one aspect. The other is, I, I think, an interesting point that she was told to detonate anywhere there was a crowd. And that really speaks to the indiscriminate nature of this sort of violence, um, but also the lack of, of, of kind of target planning and, and um, shows to me that it's really, in Boko Haram's sake, a, a more simplistic type of operation. Uh, and so I think even if Sambisa has, has fallen and truly been cleared, I don't know if that's really going to affect these t this type of wave of violence, given how, how simple it seems to be on, on Boko Haram's part. So I, I think the territorial aspect is, is an important part, but when we're looking in terms of reduction of violence and, and really, which is the outcome we want to see, more will need to be done. We can't expect simply uh, clearing some, some key areas, uh, albeit a very large symbolic area, to, to have an immediate impact there. Uh, in short, I think there's plenty of other safe havens in which Boko Haram operates and, and can do these sorts of things. The other sort of aspect looking at that is Boko Haram has been split into multiple factions. We're aware of that. And the faction within the Sambisa Forest, by all accounts, is that linked to Chico. But when we're looking at the group going forward, and especially looking in terms of reduction of violence, I think we need to consider all the the, the different factions going on there, and especially that the uh, other other ones might not be present in Sambisa Forest. So I just wanted to take a quick look at, at the three sort of big divisions within the Nigerian jihadist movement in, in reflection of this and, and what's kind of been happening with them recently. When we're looking at the Shiko faction, I think it's important that we have a screenshot of uh, a video he made here after the clearing of Sambisa Forest. So you can see he's still recording videos out in the open. Uh, he's still very confident in that regard. Um, which kind of then again shows uh, the impact or the lack thereof of clearing Sambisa in some ways. This uh, uh, statement, uh, he, he came out with an audio statement also in mid-January, claiming an attack at, at the University of Maiduguri and denying the narrative uh, of the government narrative in Sambisa. And I think uh, interesting to look at some of his messaging. He's come out with this new messaging wing called Wadi Baya, which translates into clear speech, but it's reverted very much to his pre-Islamic state messaging style. And so by that, I mean prior to the March 2015 pledge to the uh, Islamic state, Boko Haram's messaging was very concentrated around Shako, very concentrated on leadership. It often included uh, long-winded, rambling, repetitive statements by Shiko himself and was of poor quality. This screenshot even is, is not of, of great quality. And these are things that changed in the run-up to the pledge to the Islamic State. But it's very interesting since the division, uh, Shiko has kind of reverted to these sorts of, of messaging dynamics. Now, looking at the Abu Musab al-Barnawi faction, which is the one backed by the Islamic State, uh, and Mama Noor is, is a key militant that is uh, thought to be associated with this faction. Now, the fall of Sambisa is going to have very little impact on them. They're more in the northern part of Borno State, uh, and they've been involved in a series of, of kind of surprising and overpowering attacks on security forces uh, in which they've directly engaged them and, and forced them to retreat on occasion. Um, and a, a recent attack in Kamuya, uh, Yobe State, was very typical of these patterns in which soldiers had to withdraw until reinforcements were arrived. So it's a very different sort of, of threat, really, than, than uh, what the Shiko faction is doing. And, and recently, they've claimed uh, a few more attacks in Yobe and also one in Difa in southern Niger. So expanding a little bit the attack range beyond this northern Borno State corridor. When we look at their messaging, there's only been one real video since the August 2016 split, and that came out just after. Rather, they've relied more on Islamic State social media broadcasts uh, advertising their attacks. There have been over a dozen of those. 
since August. Um, so, so it shows uh, there might be having a little bit of trouble getting out these videos, especially in comparison to, to the production Chico's been able to do since the split. But one thing that they have done is started distributing some photos or some images, again, through Islamic State media channels. So this shows the continued media linkages uh, between the Banari faction and their Islamic State backers. Uh, but I, looking at the messaging, I think there's also two two interesting aspects that they've chosen to emphasize. And one have been the, the very operational aspects of their movement. So showing their success as a fighting entity. Uh, so this includes militants during attacks uh, or uh, militants with the spoils that they've seized after attacks, so arms, ammunition, and whatnot. So really showing their success on that front. But the other aspect that they've started to emphasize recently are some non-operational aspects of the movement and some more um, uh, sort of a not fighting uh, um, aspects. So we have some photos here. The, the ones on the uh, left are from an initial batch showing the daily life of militants. And so you can see one reading the Quran. You can see some others uh, working on a laptop while, while uh, some surrounded by some weapons. Uh, and then, interestingly, I think the ones on, on the other side are showing the implementation of Sharia justice in an unnamed lake, location in the Lake Chad area. So uh, you can see in the top corner, uh, morality police, and they have very specific uniforms there uh, going into a market, and they read out a, a punishment and, and then uh, delivered the verdict in, in front of a crowd there. So that, to me, shows them... Uh, that this sort of emphasis on these non-operational aspects of the movement is more emphasizing their ability to um, impose justice or uh, deliver justice in the region and, and be a governing entity. So it really speaks to these wider aspirations of, again, territorial control and having uh, an Islamic state in that area. And so I think that's a stark contrast to Chicot's speeches, which has predominantly been about him. Now, uh, going forward, the third movement we should just discuss quickly, though they haven't really done much recently, is, is the Ansaru movement. And they made a lot of headlines in 2012, 2013 for breaking away from Boko Haram and a series of foreign national kidnappings. But really nothing has been heard from them in about two years up until last month when in al Risala, which is an uh, English language magazine, but coming from Al-Qaeda groups in Syria, published a piece supposedly from uh, Ansaru leader Abu Usma Tal Ansari. Now, we should remember that Khaled al-Banawi, the, the presumed leader of Ansaru, and not to be consumed, uh, confused with Abu Musab al-Banawi, but Khaled al-Banawi was arrested this past April in Kogi State in, in uh, southern, southern central Nigeria. Um, and this, that's a fact that this article also confirms. And the article goes on to, to explain why they broke from Chico's movement, predominantly over issues of uh, the permissibility of targeting Muslims, as the, the uh, female bomber being told to detonate anywhere there's a crowd, the, these sorts of attacks that speaks to. But again, I think it's very interesting, and in one, that we haven't heard anything from Ansaru in two years and really thought the movement more or less ceased to exist. But two, that the messaging upset over Shako mirrors that of the Barnawi split, the, the Islamic State uh, split with Shako over the permissibility of Muslim casualties. But that's not mentioned in this article at all. And that makes sense given that it is an Al-Qaeda publication. But I, I think it shows us that we kind of have a two major fault lines in the Nigerian jihadist movement, one revolving around these Muslim casualties, which has caused groups to break from Shako, and then the second mirroring this larger Al-Qaeda Islamic State uh, intra-jihadist divide. Um, you know, although Ansaru really hasn't proven itself to be operational, uh, tying this back to Sambisa, the pursuit of Sambisa really only looks at one of these, these factions in a divided Nigerian uh, jihadist movement. So I think i uh, also just touch quickly on some of the humanitarian aspects because we can't really talk about Boko Haram after Sambisa, the Lake Chad Basin region, without addressing this uh, situation, which, which continues to be 
dire. Uh, presence is expanding in a lot of areas, but especially in northern Borno State, areas where the Bernawi faction is thought to be operating, remain uh, entire LGAs remain off limits, and others just have partial access. So it is, it is a continual uh, expansion, but uh, not all. Uh, there's still plenty of people living in areas that have not been reached. And uh, a big event that happened in, in mid-January symbolizes sort of the, the tragic situation of many of these IDPs. And what happened was essentially the Nigerian Air Force pursuing some Boko Haram members mistakenly hit an IDP camp in the area of Iran in um, Borno State. Uh, it's a pretty tragic situation. Uh, to the credit, I think the Nigerian army did uh, step up right away and, and admit their mistake. Uh, perhaps they haven't announced a, a full death toll. I think officially they're saying around 112, while some eyewitnesses have put it more in the 200s. Uh, it is a better response than I can imagine a few years ago, and perhaps that's because there are some more international organizations on the ground and some were actually present at the camp. Uh, unfortunately, had some of their, their staff killed. But it's still a, just a tragic situation and symbolizes the constant struggle of these IDPs, many who fled from areas of Boko Haram control only to be housed in these camps under, under government control and then in this situation wind up being uh, bombed by their own government. There is an investigation ongoing into how that uh, could happen and I think That'll be an important test of, of government sincerity in this regard, how much they're willing to assign blame and enact measures to prevent this from happening again. And I think it's a really important symbol uh, in terms of reestablishing trust amongst the local population who are really caught between Boko Haram and the government. And incidents like this really don't uh, uh, make the government look that attractive either. Uh, and just uh, two other quick issues, looking at funding concerns coming up forward uh, after San in, in 2017. Demands or, or sort of needs have, have increased. Uh, aid agencies are estimating they're going to need $1 billion to cover the Lake Chad Basin crisis this year in 2017. Now, this is more than double from last year, and this has grown in part as the scale of crisis has grown, which has, has been also informed by getting more access to areas that were uh, previously inaccessible. There is a donor conference coming up in Oslo at the end of this month to address this issue and shed light on what is really a bit of an overlooked crisis. Um, last year had a shortfall of $200 million in terms of what donors provided and what aid agencies were asking for. So there's the hope that this gap can be closed a bit uh, this year, but it's a significant amount of money that uh, will need to be required. Uh, at the same time, there's some signs of, of strained relations between uh, the government and, and these uh, aid agencies. The federal government itself has complained on, on multiple occasions that aid agencies are ex exaggerating the scale of the crisis, especially with regards to hunger. But more recently, and I think more credibly, Borno State Governor Kashim Shetima lashed out at what he called non-performing agencies. And he singled out uh, some, such as UNICEF in particular, though some other big names uh, like WFP, ICRC, uh, IOM, he, he commended for doing a good job. And he later walked back some of his comments, but essentially they symbolized how, uh, in his mind, out of the 126 NGOs present in Borno State, only in his estimation eight were doing, really providing services and doing uh, uh, significant um, providing, uh, doing a significant amount with the money that they've been getting. So I think this ties into these concerns about uh, uh, overall funding and whatnot. And uh, so it's not just about getting the money. It's also there are a lot of organizations doing a lot of good work in a very difficult situation. But ensuring that that trust between these organizations and the host government actors uh, continues. Um, so with that, I think uh, we'll open it up to some questions on, uh, there's obviously more we can talk about on the humanitarian situation and also looking at Boko Haram and, and its, its division um, going forward uh, with the fall of Sambisa and what that really means and what it doesn't. 